Hi there, it's Kevin with RogueDeckBuilder.com here with this week's episode of the Market Monday. I apologize in advance, I'm not going to have any snazzy editing, uh, and I'm really going to do this on fast paced as I'm running very, very late today. But instead of not giving you a video, at least you'll get a little bit of a market analysis on the post pro tour, as well as a bit of a rant. I have debated and debated and debated and debated about doing this video. Uh, one thing I'm not very good at is utilizing a filter. I guess that's never been a strong point of mine growing up. I always have this almost like foot and mouth type of uh, problem where I can't stop myself sometimes from saying things that might or even realizing that things that I may say may offend or really tick people off. But I guess that's one of my strengths and my weaknesses of being a very headstrong person is that I'm not afraid to actually say what I believe in and do what I believe in, which a lot of people find admirable. And again, a lot of people find very, very annoying or like I said before, just either either rash or offensive. So first of all, let me talk about the From the Vault lore. As you may know, we put a few of them up on our website. We get a very, 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 very limited amount of From the Vault. Um, we are the smallest tier of a local game store. And we put them up for $80 because at the time, that was the market value on eBay. And right here, too, is MCG Goldfish's analysis. They actually don't sell them. They have just a referral fee, I'm sure, through either Amazon or eBay, where you can uh, click here and it will send you to eBay and look at all the different people that are, are selling different products. So we put it up, we put up the From the Vaults on the website and I immediately get bombarded with Twitter responses about how I'm an ethical person and how we are price gouging. So first of all, I just wanna talk about a little bit of economic theory. Um, I studied economics as not as a major or anything in school but as a hobby is mine that's kind of why i do the rogue market i've always been fascinated with the psychology of markets daniel kahneman is a hero of mine he was first a, a kind of a, a psychologist and or a philosopher actually and he actually made a fortune on figuring out kind of how the market actually is affected more by how humans feel about it than actually empirical data. So I've always been fascinated with him. I'm a huge, huge fan of, of old economists like Adam Smith and uh, Pareto. Um, huge, per, huge believer in meritocracy and capitalism and, and things like that. So I'm not the best person if, 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 if you don't subscribe to those type of philosophies, libertarianism, capitalism, uh, meritocracy, I might, yeah, rub you the wrong way. I hope that I don't lose any subscribers for, for my personal opinions on markets, but I thought I'd at least try to address this on my perspective. So we've also had some other YouTubers in the past come out and talk about price gouging and how particular companies are basically controlling the uh, supply and overcharging and how anything above MSRP is just, just a really, really unethical and immoral and blah, 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 blah. Well, markets are set up on what we call supply and demand. If you are going to really blame anyone for the price of From the Vault's lore, Wizards is to blame for their low, low release of From the Vault's lore. Wizards is also to blame for the Oath of the Gatewatch and the Battle for Zendikar fat packs going up in such a price and not meeting the demand. MSRP literally, literally means manufacturer's suggested retail price and how a manufacturer actually comes to that. So the manufacturer of the product gives that suggested retail price just as like a guideline of what they think you should probably or what they think that you can sell it for. What they're, they try to make a guesstimate of, you know, how much they're going to sell it to you for, how much they're going to produce and where they really think how, how their analysis of the market thinks that the price of the goods can be sold. A lot of manufacturers sell products themselves. So when they actually put on an MSRP, they're also saying that they're not going to compete with you at a lower price. So, so I don't wizards themselves, unless they have some sort of distribution through Walmart or if, if, if they control that, I'm not exactly sure the umbrella of the, how Wizards of the Coast operates, but if you go to Walmart and you go to Target, they're going to sell booster packs at a little above MSRP. And they do this so that they don't kill their uh, their local game stores and other people that sell their product. Basically, just giving that manufacturer suggested retail price so they do not compete with their own sellers. 
All right. That is not, has nothing to do with supply and demand. Supply and demand, I am a huge believer again in capitalism, and I am one of those people that thinks money is the root of all good or the, the root of all fairness. If you have something I want and I have capital to buy that, we make an exchange, and that is what Pareto would call uh, kind of the Pareto efficiency, where two people make a transaction where neither is hurt and both are satisfied. And a lot of people would feel that, that BrokeDeckBuilder.com, for example, putting up from the vault lore, is violating that that whole uh, transaction. But it's it just goes back to supply and demand. If everyone were to sell uh, from the vault's lore at a very very low price, there would be people that want the goods and service more than someone else that would not have that opportunity to buy. Setting a market price is the most moral thing in the entire world because the people that actually want the goods more than someone else have the opportunity to buy that. Now we can argue about just you know poverty and people not being able to afford certain things, which I, I agree. Some things are ridiculous uh, in the Magic the Gathering world when like standard decks become an insane price. This is a collector's item. It has nothing to do, this is not going to affect gameplay whatsoever. A ton of the cards are actually banned in Modern that would actually see Modern play. Legacy is already so far from being able to be played, it's not really going to affect the prices of Legacy because it's such a small print run and a lot of these foil shiny things are just collector value. So I think that if anything was a moral and ethical thing, it would be allowing collectors to decide the price of what they're willing to pay for this. So now let's just look at it from my perspective as a, as a local game store. We have no demand at, in fact, we, we uh, set out at our local game store. We, we have asked our locals if they wanted any of these from the vault lore before they knew what was in it. We said, who wants to pre-order them at, at actually a little under MSRP? We were going to sell them for slightly under for pre-orders to make sure that we had enough capital to actually purchase them. A lot of these are a gamble. I remember from the Knights of Annihilation lost uh, the store before us a lot of money because they got stuck with a lot of, of items that you can't turn. For a very, very small local game store, turning your product into capital at a very, very fast rate is life or death for the store. One of the mistakes the store before us made was, was trying to branch off into anime and trying to branch off in... Um, into board games and a lot of things that had a very, very long shelf life. What I mean by that is it took forever for those certain things to, to actually sell and where it would have been best used into products that would have a fast turnaround to keep the, 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 the uh, capital rolling so they can, they can buy more goods to sell to the store and then just keep increasing the profits. So from the vaults are very, very risky. Some of these boxes are very risky. So I feel since a lot of the, our local people didn't want them and in fact once the the um the uh, some of these cards were spoiled our locals still didn't want them because we have zero demand for legacy we have a huge commander group which there's a few commander cards like jit and dark depths that could go in a few decks but our commander players didn't value those cards uh we have a huge modern scene of course those two cards are banned the only thing out of the the, the decks that even sees modern play is the Telerian west which is now uh, used to be a huge centerpiece of the now band deck. It still sees some play, not nearly as much as it did in the Summer Bloom deck. So anyway, so it's if we were to sell them locally at MSRP, I guarantee you this is what happened. I already know that there are a few people, there are two people in particular that run an eBay store here in my local town that immediately would buy them all up at our MSRP and then go throw them on eBay for uh, the $70, $80 and then just make a profit that way. So why should I as a local game store give them the opportunity to profit off, off of off of a goods that I could profit for higher. I don't think that is is the moral responsibility of a store. Uh, I think actually the moral responsibility of everyone is to get the most out of their particular uh, products. Like it is my moral. That's what Pareto. If you go study a um, the old Italian philosopher Pareto, it's it's my moral responsibility to, uh, of or what would be the best scenario for me to make as much money as possible off a transition transaction and it's your moral responsibility as a consumer to get the best value and where we come to what we call Pareto equilibrium is where neither of us can budge anymore and that is what an un like un unaltered or, or really unregulated un, un uh, yeah just unaltered would be the right word 
uh, market would come to. You'd come to a pretzel equilibrium where it would be worth it for the seller and worth it to the buyer at a point where neither of them can move up or down. Uh, that is what's happening right now with From the Vault's lore on eBay is we're starting to see where is that going to be. Is that going to be through 60 uh, to $90? Is it going to go a little bit less? And that's why we decided at Rogue Deck Builders to put them up on 80 Now, out of two things, A, all of the money, every single bit of the money that is purchased from the From the Vault's lore directly benefits the Rogue Deck Builder channel. I have talked and talked and talked about how much money it costs to run this channel. Just for example, just on Twitch yesterday, we brewed a deck. Uh, it cost me a good 35 tickets to build the remaining pieces of that deck. I made zero off that Twitch stream. I was net down negative $35. So I hope that we, I just have a little bit of compassion from my viewers and whatnot for when we try to actually make a good profit like off these from the vaults lore where the demand is higher than the supply or off the eternal masters uh, this is the time where we actually can be profitable. Uh, the packs, booster packs we sell for 3 for $10 just to compete. Uh, otherwise, people will go elsewhere with their business. That makes us very, very, very little profit margin, which is so funny because when people get a good deal or under MSRP, they don't cry bloody murder at themselves for not paying MSRP. But when a store raises something above MSRP, now they're the big, bad, vile uh awful people. Now, I do sympathize with price gouging. I think that Magic the Gathering in the past has had some conglomerates that have come together and really manipulated the market on Fetchlands was for one of them, and it's really, really, it's tickling me that Fetchlands are actually uh, losing a ton of value in a lot of these vendors that actually invested heavily on polluted Deltas and Blood St. Myers and all those from Cons Constructor here actually losing money now selling these for for uh, less than what they bought it for. I remember like some buy list prices on Pluto Delta were 18 bucks, and now after like just the the fees of selling cards and just the time it takes to actually sell them, some of these vendors are actually losing a lot of money on that particular spec. So I I'm with you. I don't like it when people corner the market. A price gouging would be if one vendor were to to get all of the from the vault lures and then buy them up at MSRP, then spike them up and then say, we are the only supply now of that. But that's not what's happening. We have multiple people competing across the board to try to give you the lowest price for From the Vault's lore. That just happens to be above MSRP. It is my ethical responsibility to my business, as it is for everyone else that is doing the same thing, to make the most profit uh, that they can per item. Now, you may disagree with me. You may think I'm a bad person, but that is just the reality of life. And I just, I just came to the point where I was just sick and tired of the Twitter nonsense or just the nonsense messages that I get about ethics and morals and when it comes to economics. And they're just so far off. I, I'm just, I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it. Tired of the entitledness. I'm tired of the, uh, basically the, the, the finger pointing. And it, there's a real, real simple rule in basically supply and demand or in economics. If you don't want to pay that price for it, then don't buy it. Simple as that. All right, I hope we've addressed that. I, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely okay if you have critical things in the comment section below, go for it. I'm, I'm all for it. I'm ready for a battle. Let Bring it. Bring it on. I, it's, it's to the point that I think our society is so polarized on this issue where we have you know two very, very extreme sides just at war with how we should run things and what's ethical and uh, I just... Anyway, now on to the good old market Monday. So I'm not, again, I'm not going to go too in depth of this after a, a 13 minute rant, but there is a, a lot that has changed over this week because this is the week of right after the Pro Tour Eldritch Moon. Uh, this is actually one of the most, most captivating Pro Tours I think of all times. I watched a ton of it. Usually I actually don't watch much of the Pro Tour because of how redundant some of the decks are, how bad some of the matchups are, blah, blah, blah. And I just kind of watch the prices go up and down and, and look at deck lists and stuff like that. But this Pro Tour was awesome. This Pro Tour had some great games, had some back and forth, had some uh, nail biting or cliff hanging type games. And I think all of the decks, the, the metagame is very, very diverse. And I think it has a lot of diversity to come and a lot of exploration through different brews uh, that I think that there is a huge opening now with Bant Company being uh, basically dethroned. And 
now we're going to see a lot more innovation. So let's just go ahead. If I'm, I'm here on MTG Goldfish, I've been, I've been looking at, looks like I've been sponsored to advertise their side. I'm not sponsored by MTG Goldfish. I love to give them shout outs. I love to just kind of showcase their site because this is the most in, informative site out there. They, they do a wonderful job at MTG Goldfish on their articles, on their price data, on everything. And, and again, I'm not sponsored at all by these guys. I've been using them since their inception. Wonderful, wonderful site, and that's why I'm just gonna go check out Seth's um, Saffron Olive. Seth, uh, his article here is beautifully written, so I, I highly suggest that you go check it out as he breaks down the numbers, the conversion rates. What a conversion rate is is how many of the Pro Tour Day One decks made it into Pro Tour Day Two. He also does give kind of the the disclaimer that some people that did terrible in draft would not make it to Pro Tour Day 2 if their decks did justify making it there. So anyway, the first I want to talk about is kind of these, these Black Green Delirium decks. Black Green Delirium decks I don't think have a lot of room to, gr room to grow in any of the cards because they've all recently gone up. The two cards that I think could go up in value, I highly, highly suggest you don't invest in because it will be so temporary. The first one is Nissa Vastwood Seer, and the second one is Den Protector. I think over the weekend we got to see how good Nissa is with Emerge, or if we don't need to emerge Nissa. I mean, it's just a, what was the, there was a human back in the day that did exactly, or an elf that did the exact same thing as Nissa Vastwood Seer. Nissa Vastwood Seer is just a, an upside to that, that if you do have seven or more lands, it then flips into a Planeswalker that is one of the better Planeswalkers in the format because of the, the card draw, the ability to protect yourself with a 4-4 green elemental, and an ultimate that can just win the game. So I would say if, if Nyssa and, and Den Protector had any longer shelf life, I would say invest in these because I think they're criminally underpriced. However, vendors are going to get rid of these cards no matter what, and I highly suggest you do the same with any cards from Dragons of Tarkira Origins as they are past their life expectancy. It is time to sell out of them. You will not have enough time to make any sort of profit investing in these before the natural, uh, basically, death due to rotation occurs. The other cards in the, the Black Green Delirium decks have probably already peaked with maybe the exception of Grim Flare. Grim Flare is, is what, sitting around like 14-ish dollars and could go up. This was my pick for a myth that, could, that has the highest room to grow because it is usually a deck that wants this, wants four of them. And the Sam Pardee's deck wanted four of them. It was very good all night. This card gets so much better when Languish rotates out of the format. It will get even better when Sylvan Advocate uh, rotates out of the format unless there is a better replacement than Sylvan Advocate as at this point like it gets blanked by Reflector Mages and and Spell Quellers and uh, Sylvan Advocates and then the problem with like Grim Flayer is once you do get Delirium it's still about the same time that Sylvan Advocate is going to get its plus and it's just really competing with the Sylvan Advocate slot. This slot, this person however did like the Sylvan Ad or the Grim Flayer over the Sylvan Advocate what I think about the other competitor, which is the snake, the snake that allows you to discard cards, is the Grim Flayer actually works very well with that card. So I think the de decks that want the Reach Snake, uh, the new Wild Mongrel, whatever that card is, will also want Grim Flayers. And it's pretty much proven itself. Grass of Darkness is going to stick around for quite a while. Traverse the Uven Wild is going to stick around for quite a while. And these other self-mill cards like Liliana are going to stick around for quite a while. So these green-black rock-type control decks are going to survive post rotation. So I think the Grim Flare has a long, long lifespan. So if you haven't invested them, this could be, in my opinion, the new Voice of Resurgence. But with the exception that Voice of Resurgent was in a very, very unpopular set and was the only card that was worthwhile in that set, and therefore the price of it was just insane because no one wanted to buy Dragons, uh, Dragons Maze because it was such a bad set. Uh, so I don't think Grim Flare is going to hit that level, but I think that 15 to $20 is probably the right price point for Grim Flare. So again, I think that it's either a hold or slightly buy into these if you think you're going to be playing these within the next year, year and a half. I think Tyler's Tracker is always going to suffer from the fact that it was an intro pack and plenty of these copies just exist. Ishkana is an also, also another wild card because it's a little it's it's also super great with Emerge. It's a card that you get the value out of it when you do cast it and, and leave back the green spider creature tokens. And multiples of this are actually quite justifiable. The problem is in most of these Delirium decks, they end up being uh, kind of tutor-based decks using your graveyard as the uh, tutor. So multiples of these 
can just be found through cards like Traverse the Uvenwald or just finding them in your graveyard through even even uh, uh, cards like Grim Flare or cards like the Grapple, the Pass, and then just returning them to your hand. So Ishkana, I, I, I continue to see is mainly just a two or a three of, but as people pointed out, there's just as many Ishkanas in the Pro Tour as there was Amrakul's, and Amrakul is twice, a little more than twice the amount of money as Ishkana. They're both mythics from the exact same set. So this, I think, is just going to suffer uh, from the casual pill. Every time that it, there, there's like a centered focal piece of a deck, it's going to be more expensive than the other pieces to the deck just because of how focused people are of the, of the win condition. So collected company decks, even though they run just as many Sylvan Advocates as a collected company, collected company is going to still be more expensive. Plus, it is modern playable. I think the Emrakul is now a commander fa favorite. Every commander deck wanted to pick up a piece, whereas not every Ishkana or every green deck wanted to pick up an Ishkana in their commander. So, it, of course, there is that casual pill that is, that is uh, making the price go up higher. So some of these other cards out of the stack, uh, Kalatas seemed to have a pretty good showing. I think Kalatas might start to rebound. Um, it was uh, in the sideboard of most of the black decks or in the main main of most of the uh, control based decks. It continues to be such a great card that does get a little bit better when Languish gets out of the deck. Still does die to Grass of Darkness, but usually you're the one playing Grass of Darkness with Kalatas. Kalatas is just what I consider the perfect card. It is very good in a mid-range deck. It is very good in a control deck. And it's actually decently good in a curve topper deck and really good at making cards like... Uh, the, well, Hangerback Walker for one, or any card that wants to die, it really blanks out those those uh, die effect type decks. And I'm sure we'll see some in the next set that we need to actually hate out, and Kalatas is going to be your go-to card. So other than that, that is that's probably the best analysis I can give you for the Green Black Delirium. The Bant Company, what we learned from Bant Company, the first one is A, that it is not the, not the, like a presser that we really thought that Bant Company was going to be. I really thought that Spellcaller might, or people were talking about how this could be the new Cobblade or the Mono Black Control uh, that we saw a couple seasons ago in Theros, that, they're, that this was just the best deck and we're just going to have to deal with that. Well, it got beat up. It got really beat up, but two of them made the top eight and a lot of the camera time with Bant Company was very impressive with how fast this deck can be with a, a good pilot. I think that Lewis Scott Vargas showed us some really, really cool tricks you can do. Uh, the other dude that ran the Bant Company showed us some really good sideboard cards that you can bring in to hate out uh, Emrakul. And I'll talk about one of those specifically, what I think has the most potential because it's also starting to see some modern play. We'll get to that in a minute. But Selfless Spirit is wonderful. This is a card that I think could go up even more because it does. it is starting to see a lot more play in Modern. $5 is kind of the what I call the threshold for rares in an open set. But maybe in a couple more sets, Selfless Spirit, you always need to keep this on your radar. And if it ever does fall behind the $5 price point, I think that's the time to get into it. And just... Yeah, just if, for whatever reason, I know this is a late summer set, and if history does repeat itself, late summer sets tend to be the least opened, especially with Conspiracy coming out quite soon. Um, then if if that does, if that is the case, then Selfless Spirit's uh, supply will actually be a little bit lower than traditional sets, uh, second sets. So Selfless Spirit could easily go to that $8, $9, $10 range, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't count on it. I think that... If history is anything, I mean, just look at this card that's right below it, which is Sylvan Advocate, which is the most placed card. I think it's either the most or the second most placed played card at the Pro Tour. I think Tyler's Tracker might have beat it out. And same, there you go, Tyler's Tracker as well. They can't beat out the $5 price tag, so I have a hard time thinking that Selfless Spirit is going to be the exception to that rule. Collected Company is a focal point of the, we've already talked about the casual appeal of this, the modern appeal to this. Just the focus of the deck, it's called company, and the namesake is always going to be worth more than the other ones. And so for that reason, I don't think that, that self of Spirit is, 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 is going to be a, a card I'd pick up of. Spell Queller really did see that it was beatable. This card, I think, is going to go down just because of the exact same reason. I, I, it's not being played more than these other rares. So people are just, they're just... It suffers from the fact that it's the same thing with Collected Company. When you do tend to play it, it tends to be very, very powerful. 
And but I wouldn't say that this is a bigger piece in the deck than say Reflector Mage or Sylvan Advocate or Selfless Spirit. And I think the Spellcaller just has to go down just because the the estimated value of the Eldritch Moon is just too high for a rare to continue to be above that twelve thirteen dollar price point. What is it fourteen bucks? Yeah, it's got to go down. And again, it didn't even see as much play as so Sylvan Advocate or Tireless Tracker, which are also rares in in the format. Dramokas Command is another card I would say that you should invest heavily in, but Dramokas Command is going to be rotating. The thing I like about both Self of Spirit and Dramokas Command is they both blank Kozlux return. Uh, count, this basically prevents the damage of target instant or sorcery spell. This gives your guys indestructible. So Bat Company does have tools versus the Emerge decks. They can easily win against that matchup. So the other cards, so let's go down to White Black Control, which actually won the Pro Tour. The Archangel Avacyn continues to still be the, the very, very dominant card. I think that back, going back up to $25 is probably, 20 to $25 is going to be the range of Archangel Avacyn. Again, it's because we've had some weird things happen with Shadows of Innistrad. We've had some leapfrogging. We had Nahiri go crazy in Modern. So once a, a card value goes up, another one has to go down. Otherwise, the estimated value of a set is going to be higher than the, the price of actually opening a booster box. And at that point, vendors just start to open packs so they can make the, the quick profit on that. So they, they have these... Car sets that are in print have uh, a very easy way of regulating themselves. We're not going to see like another World Wake where Wizards just doesn't print enough of the set. And it actually, I think World Wake was like the first set to really go out of print when it was still way in, I think it was even almost still in drafting when it, it was impossible to find. And Wizards just more savvy at getting their supply out and, and whatnot. So I don't, I, I don't know that... That maybe Archangel Avacyn can break that $25 mark. We've seen Gideon that sees a ton of play, was the number one, four of in the number one deck for quite a while. It's even the sideboard of this deck, uh, have a hard time uh, really breaching over that $20 mark. So I think that's pretty good for Avacyn. Liliana, I think, is just one of those cards that has to go down. I, I don't think it can it hold its $50 price tag. I think that going back down to the $25 mark is probably right. It's so funny that Gideon is. I, I have a hard time seeing Liliana see as much play as Gideon did last season. And or the even the season before that, Gideon saw a ton of play. Uh, so it's just one of those things that I, the Liliana's just more popular than Gideon as far as just the, the planeswalker. And it's so funny how that, that actually affects price tags. But even in this deck, there was more Gideons, overall Gideons to build this deck than there was Liliana's. And so again, we just have to wait and see if if this does suffer from the, the summer set, the late summer set, uh, uh, Eldritch Moon, where there just is going to be a low amount of these opened. I, I'm not quite sure. I think that people are going to continue to open Eldritch Moon, just how impactful it was for this tournament. Um, languish, languish decks, uh, have stopped being as dominant because they're easy to attack with spell queller. Languish is another card that is going to be rotating soon. Do not invest in it. Howled Moonlight, however, this is a card that I think you should keep on your radar because of how dominant this card has the potential of being in modern. We're seeing Dredge. We're seeing, uh, the Goro's Vengeance and Through the Breach type decks. Uh, we're seeing other... Like combo based decks, like uh, the the swords, sort of the meat combo. How Moonlight blanks it for at least a turn. Anything that is not cast gets exiled, and you still get to draw a card. I have been having a phenomenal time with this card in the Soul Sister sideboard, as well as like Hate Bears and other cards. Like they're they're Aether Violing in a card can get countered by Howled Moonlight. There are so many things that the lingering souls even if you have to counter half a lingering souls this card is worth it i think it's just a matter of time like the rest in pieces and the stony silences and some of these other hate cards that were go down to bulk value price that just a few years later they're five dollars or in stony silences uh case up to ten dollars so this is kind of my white pick that if this does continue to go down after rotation which i do think it will down to the 65 cent 55 cent price tag how moonlight i'm going to pick up a ton of them and i highly suggest everyone do the same so Shambling Vent is another interesting card that we have to see if enemy colors matter. I think they will in the next set in Kaladash. So if I, I think that white black is here to stay. Languish is going to hurt 
uh, getting rid of Languish, but they still have Planar Outburst, which I think a lot of these decks can do, go to, because I think in this deck, 4 to 5 isn't that big of a deal, because uh, of the ability to just still use like Grasp of Darkness and other cards on turn 2, turn 3, turn 4, and then, then rely on a Planar Outburst. But we probably still should get another good sweeper, I would say, in the next set. So I think the black-white decks, besides Languish rotating, they lose very, very little. Transgress the Mind, in my opinion, is still one of the best cards in the format. It hits almost every deck. And I think it's only a matter of time before Pick the Brain is also picked up, pun intended. And a lot of these Delirium-based decks is just an answer for Emrakul. So you can hit an Emrakul out of their hand and then get rid of all of them. Or hit hit like a Elder Deep Fiend out of their hand and get rid of them for the... For the for good, or hit a Kozlux return out of their hand and get all of them out of their graveyard. So Pick the Brain, I think, is a very underrated card. Transgress works perfectly with it. There are, uh, I think that this little archetype of just black-white control has been quite consistent for ages now, and I think will be quite consistent for times to come. So I think Shambling Vent might have the ability to, go, to hit that $5 price tag. So it's just not worth it, in my opinion, to be investing in a card that's a little bit over $3. If I really think it's ceiling in a, a set that was opened up at like uh, record numbers, which I think Zendikar still holds that. It might be Constant Arc here. I, I, I wish, I, if someone knows a good statistic, like place to look at statistics for actual amount of product opened, I love to see it because I Wizards every now and again will give little tidbits about like they'd said Return to Ravnica was the highest and they said, oh, Theros beat Return to Ravnica. And then I remember Kazatar Kir beat Theros. And then I'm pretty, I'm not quite certain that KTK has been out, outdone by Zendigar, but I would assume so. So anyway, Transgress another great way of dealing with Emrakul. This card, I think, will be a sideboard in Modern for time to come, but I think Slaughter Games and other cards like this, is it, where they're usually just a one-of sideboard, have a long time to really hit back in value in Modern. It'll take two, three, four years before a card like this, I think, will recover. So I, I, I don't think that it's a Howled Moonlight. Infinite Obliteration has, is a lot more narrow than Howled Moonlight in Modern. And yeah, just investing any card in Origins for standard's sake, I think, is a, a mistake. Uh, also, just one little quick little thing. I, I just love to show that what's missing out of here? That crap card called Gisela. Anyway, Gisela, back, I, you know, I know I've been very critical of Gisela here. I think that the only place where Gisela actually does fit is in uh, with, with Bruna. I think that that is a very powerful little um, deck, the Angel kind of control deck. And only because Gisela eats your removal spell or blanks the links the the board for one turn and then you can get value out of it later on so yubi zombies this deck is the one i think has the most potential to go up because there's a few cards that i think are still a little bit undervalued one is prized amalgam at four dollars a piece seeing such heavy play in modern and dredge and even starting to see i think people have toyed around with this card in legacy this card can definitely definitely go up in value there will be a lot of different ways of building prize amalgam decks in the future if we get any better self mill cards this card gets better i'm going to start fooling around with a soul tie list that actually uses den protector and death miss raptor with prized amalgam and possibly some other morph card we do have the counter spell morph card uh there's a black morph card that's not too shabby uh, that can get back the Death Miss Raptor that will then trigger off the prized amalgams. Uh, where I do like the prized amalgam, I think we all thought this was the coolest combination in standard, or it was when the Voldalen Pariah was hit off the Madness trigger with Haunted Dead, triggering off the... Uh, so Haunted Dead triggers off Voldalen's prized Madness as well as the prized amalgams. They all flip, and then the opponent sac or, or sacrifices the, the two, or the Haunted Dead, the prized amalgam, and the spirit token to flip the Voldalen Pariah, making the opponent sacrifices Emrakul, his, his, uh, um, Elder Deep Fiend, or, you know, something like that. It, this card, I knew this card was underrated. I knew it was powerful. It started to go up. I hope you guys picked your play set up after I, I, I hyped this card up. Uh, love it. Love this card. I think it gets better in other Madness type decks. I'm, I'm surprised we haven't seen a call the Bloodline with Voldown Pariah and f the From Under the Floorboards. I still think that's a pretty powerful little strategy. Uh, we'll have to wait and see though. Crit Breaker 2. Crit Breaker could go up in value after this. Jace, I love Jace. I don't think that Jace can, has any more room to grow just because people are going to, uh, the great sell off of Origins and Dragons Turk here. So, uh, Dark Salvation does seem a little bit 
undervalued for a three of in many of these zombie based decks but i think that the new way that zombies is going to morph over since this this particular zombie deck if you read down here did the worst out of any of the the quote unquote tier one decks or one of the most popular played decks i think people are going to transition over to soul tie zombies i think the soul tie is just a little more consistent with the the self mill uh aspect to it um one little quick thing too is i still like disdained mindbender it's a little bit overhyped though or overvalued i think this should settle down um, with more packs being opened. I, th I think that since this didn't have as such a great of an impact on most of the decks and that Elder Deep Fume did, that this could go down to a dollar or a 50 cent card. And I think that's the time to pick the Distended Mindbenders up. So then we have the Four Color Emerge. This is the deck that I think had the most uh, camera time, had Olin Turtwald on it, that had some really, really uh, cliff-hanging, nail-biting type ga games. This deck can be built multiple ways, but they all center around Kozlik's Return. I do not know how I missed this card. How in the world did I miss Kozlik's Return with the Emerge? The problem with Kozlik's Return that we had during just Zendikar and Oath of Gatewatch is there was really no card that you wanted to cast to actually trigger off Kozlik's Return with the exception of World Breaker. World Breaker was the one card that was reasonably costed at 7 that could actually trigger off the Kozlik's Return. No one's going to cast the... What was the other ones? The the ruinous processor and the uh, there was the, what the ten nine trample guy or the nine with all these other ones were just playing garbage and then it was this Ulamog and then Kozlik himself ended up being so bad and so now we have these emerge cards that can really 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 exploit the Kozlik's return because you can get these out on turn four turn th as quick as even I believe yeah turn four is usually when they like to cast the Elder Deep Fiend, and that triggers back Kozlik's Return and taps down all their lands. We saw that over and over. So speaking of which, so this four, four color merge deck used the prized amalgam and used kind of a noose constrictor and self-mill type strategy to get the Kozlik's Return in the graveyard, and they still had the ability to get the prized amalgams back after a board wipe. That is kind of their 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 trick with this this deck. The other ones... Like Owen Turtonwalds was just trying to get Emrakul out. So control, control, control until they can cast Emrakul. I think the Emrakul won almost all of Owen Turtonwalds games. Elder Deep Fiend beat down one a few of them. But this is a really, really good deck, and it's here to stay. And so I think that the one card that absolutely can go up in value is Kozlik's Return. I picked I picked a play set up as I was watching the Pro Tour. And so they're thirteen dollars. They hit up to eighteen, back down to thirteen. I think that this could easily breach the twenty dollar if Emerge becomes the tier tier one a uh, tier one deck, which I absolutely do think it will. The one problem with the the uh, Emerge decks is that it did they did get beat up, and when I mean beat up, it was Owen Turnwald lost to the black white deck twice. Um, he played the guy in the uh, day two got beat by it and then had to play him again of course for the finals and he got beat up by it and so the black white control is definitely the the problematic card for the Kozlik's return but i think that the card if, if any card is undervalued it's that because it is the focal point of the deck uh it's more important in these decks in emrakul and there is a few other decks that are just now running at sideboard as well as it's still a good way to clean up human tokens and if you are running any emerge type card it is just so so good and so we see we see the Kozlik, we saw the Kozlik's turn in another there was a mono red Eldrazi deck too that was really really doing wonders with the card so that's my analysis of this one I think the Kozlik's return if you don't have your play set it's kind of smart to pick up I always do like Chandra I think that twelve dollars is so under that's a this card is so phenomenally good but the problem is it's in oath the gate watch again and something has to give if anything goes up so here's the card i want to talk about this is the card that i think is the most well positioned to move up in value which is summary dismissal summary dismissal just seems incredibly good to me it is the counter for emrakul so if emrakul continues to be the boogeyman in the format Summary Dismissal is the go-to card for Spirits. It's also the go-to card for Collected Company decks to defeat the Emrakul decks. So we saw this card basically completely destroy Owen Turtonwald's strategy when he cast Emrakul. But then Owen Turtonwald top-decked out of his... I think he double top-decked out of his way to beat the Bant Company deck. But the Summary Dismissal did so much work. Not only that, but it also counters the Kozlik's Return. So you exile all spells and counter all abilities. So if they cast any merge card... Uh, to trigger off the Kozik's turn, you can you can you can basically 
cast a summary's dismissal they still do have the option to not cast the kozirx return just the weird wording on kozirx return that when you cast it then you may cast so it would go on stack above or and then it would get countered when it resolves it's kind of it's just kind of weird how it works interacts with this this sort of thing but summary's dismissal is is i think a powerhouse that we can, we can start seeing more than just the one of in a sideboard. If uh, if it is the go-to card against the Emrakul, this card is going to be more than a one of in a lot of decks. So be looking for this. I think eighty-six dollars is very very under undervalued for a card that blanks another particular card. And same thing with this Coax of the Blind Eternity. Speaking of like taking out Emrakul, transgress the mind, pick the brain. This is your way of actually combating those type of cards with Emrakul, Coax of Blind Eternities will get it back from exile. It says you may choose an Eldrazi card from outside the game or in exile. So there you go, you get it back. And I think this is pretty cool tech. If people are gonna start picking up Transgress and pick the brain and, and all these other cards at exile, Coax is gonna be uh, your go-to card. I also thought about Shambleback. Shambleback is a pretty good way to deal with Prize Amalgams and the Haunted Dead and a bunch of other cards uh, that, with the Graveyard Recursion. Uh, type theme so that is basically what the top eight what i'd like to talk about read the rest of this article i think that seth does a wonderful job looking at these other archetypes that that did very well like this seven and two nine legendary and this nine one thermo thing that apparently they didn't do so hot drafting otherwise they probably would have made top eight with these type of decks so this is a very, very long Market Monday with a, a bonus rant. Again, I'm not going to do any schnazzy editing. 40 minutes long, we're going to call it good right here. I'd like to know your thoughts on Pro Tour um, Eldritch Moon. Did you enjoy it as much as I did? I think this was a knockout of the park for Wizards of the Coast. I think that they did a, a phenomenal job. The coverage was a little bit meh. It was a little bit ugh. The cover, coverage has always been bad for Wizards of the Coast. But I think that this is this at least the the meta game the the overall healthiness of the meta game of the standard format is just a knock out of the park. I think we're gonna have a lot of fun with this format. I think it's wide open to a ton of strategies, which is so so relieving. Uh, looking at that Star City two Star City opens in a row when Bant Company just completely dominated, and I think this will definitely shake things up. And we're gonna have some great brews up and coming. Speaking of brews, we have the Rogue Master Brewer that is going on over at the roguedeckbuilder.com so if you have a deck you'd like to submit for the rogue master brewer it is just cards from eldritch moon you need, you need to pick a card from eldritch moon uh put we suggest putting three to four copies of it in your deck and it needs to be the focal point of the deck and you can submit those to rogue deck builder and then we will you have until uh, the third week in august to submit decks and then we'll start the process of uh, choosing the Rogue Master Brewer. So we have some su sweet prizes for that. I also have a 24,000 subscriber Q&A coming up. Be looking forward to that, as well as the other uh, videos that we'll be doing for the week. I'll, I'll try to get out a, a video for this week's uh, what's going on on Rogue Deck Builder. But I hope you like my long-ass video here. Hope it's helpful. It's been Kevin with RogueDeckBuilder.com. Thanks for watching.